Good evening, friends, uh, students, alums, family members, uh, former Castaneda scholars. Hey, Mike Underhill, how you doing? Uh, I know others of you are out there as well. Uh, welcome to this evening and to the Castaneda event. I'm going to turn it over to our interim president, Dr. Uh, Marsha Foster Boyd. Good evening to our friends, our students, our staff, faculty, board members, alumnus, and guests. I am the proud interim president of Chicago Theological Seminary. And tonight we welcome our speaker, Dr. Ashan Crawley, who will be introduced shortly, but it is my esteemed honor to set the stage for the evening by providing this information about this occasion. The name of this wonderful lecture series is the Castaneda Jennings Lecture. We honor most especially Gilberto Castaneda, who became an integral part of the Jennings Case family. Uh, and he was essentially adopted by Ted and Rana. And while Rana was in developing missions congregations among undocumented workers from Mexico in Bakersfield, Cal California, Gilberto was the first to be an inquirer in the formation of a small house church composed of young men with menial jobs. In the course of time, he found the love of God so compelling that he became not only a member, but also a leader in the new congregations of young people committed to the way of Jesus. Gilberto moved into Ted and Rana's home, adopting them as his new family in Christ. In the summer of 1991, Ted and Rana returned to CTF and Gilberto came with them. He became a beloved member of CTF while also struggling against the ravages of homophobic culture and repressive versions of Christianity to accept God's love of him, not only as an ardent young Christian, but also as a gay man. In December of 1992, he returned to Mexico and later went to Atlanta. There he also attended and made his mark upon the MCC church and St. Mark's United Methodist Church. Unfortunately, a series of setbacks in health, work and relationships led him to decide to return to Chicago. Two days before he arrived, he discovered what he had long suspected, that he was HIV positive. Two days before he arrived, he discovered what he had, uh, to, uh, I'm sorry, he informed Ted and Rana, and despite all the best efforts, he died two weeks later of complications due to AIDS at the age of 29. In those last days and hours, Ted was with him constantly. Jill's gentle and generous spirit never wavered in accepting himself as a gay man or in his unshakable confidence in the love of God. That CTS has chosen to honor the memory of their son, Gilberto Castaneda, with a scholarship fund is another way we honor our institutional commitments. Gilberto was one of the people it would be easy to overlook, one of the myriads too often disregarded in our society. That this was the first scholarship in a mainline seminary directed to gay and lesbian students is especially meaningful. Not only because Gilberto was a dedicated lay minister, but also because his dream was one day to prepare himself for ordained ministry. The second person we honor tonight is Dr. Ted Jennings. Ted Jennings first served on the CTS faculty from 1972 to 1978 and returned in 1991 to serve for more than two decades as professor 
of biblical and constructive theology. Between these periods, he served on the faculties of Candler School of Theology at Emory University, where he previously earned his Doctor of Philosophy degree and at the Methodist Seminary in Mexico City. He received his Bachelor of Arts from Duke University in 1964 and his Bachelor of Divinity from Emory University in 1967. Our now retired Dean and faculty colleague, Dow Edgerton has said, I met Ted in 1972, 50 years ago. I was, I, I was a first year seminarian at CTS and he was a first year professor and only six years older than I. He persuaded me of the vital necessity of doing theological work in one's own particular place and time. He taught me how to read and look with fresh eyes and to listen more deeply than I had known that I ever could. Most importantly, he awakened in me a love for the gospel of God's generosity, justice, and joy. An ordained United Methodist minister and a, con and a consultant to the United Methodist bishops on issues of poverty Ted also served local United Methodist congregations in California alongside his wife and CTS alum, Reverend Rana Case. Jennings retired from full-time teaching in 2017. Later that year, he was granted the rank of Professor Emeritus of Biblical and Constructive Theology. Ted died in February 2020 after a stroke. As former President Stephen Ray stated, it does not overstate the matter to say that CTS would not be the school we are today without Ted Jennings. Welcome to the Castaneda Jennings Lecture. Thank you so much for that, Marcia. It's 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 always still very meaningful to me to reflect on the the history of this lecture and uh, of Ted's legacy at CTS. My name is Chad Swickerath, and I am the Vice President for Advancement. What always excites me about lectures like these is that I get to look around the room, or in this case, around the screen, and I can see dozens of other folks who I've worked with over the last year to advance the work of Chicago Theological Seminary. Tonight's Castaneda Jennings Lecture and Award started with a small group of people with a simple idea. It started with the idea that queer and trans folk matter, that LGBTQ people and their families have a place in our congregations and our communities. And during a time in our country when state governments continue to propose legislation that further stigmatizes and harms the LGBTQ community, progressive leaders, progressive institutions are more important than ever. And CTS works to embody this commitment. We are an institution that has woven queer affirming theological perspectives into our curriculum, our programs, and our scholarships. CTS takes pride in its role of shaping the public square and religious communities by preparing leaders who are trained and ready to push the conversation and stand firm in the commitment to full inclusion. At these lectures each year, I have the joy to come before you and tell you about a fundraising goal we have. I tell you about the importance of reaching this goal so that CTS can continue this important work of offering programs and offering scholarships. And tonight's not all that different. However, perhaps tonight is a little bit more. CTS trustee and Doctor of Ministry alumnus, Reverend Dawson Taylor, has felt so motivated by CTS work that he went to a family in his UCC congregation in Naples, Florida, and he has secured a challenge gift, a match to our fundraising. And to my knowledge, we have never had a match for LGBTQ initiatives at CTS. This tonight is a first. And so tonight and the remainder of the month, if you give to LGBTQ initiatives at CTS, if you support this type of work, your giving will be matched two to one. That is, if you give $50, our trustee Dawson's donor will give $100 on your behalf. 
If you give $250, our donor will give CTS $500 for LGBTQ initiatives. So tonight in April, and until this challenge gift reaches its limit, your impact will be tripled. I have gone and placed the link to give in the chat. All you need to do is click the link. This year has been one of the worst years for state legislative attacks on the queer community with well over 200 bills that would limit LGBTQ rights. This is the time to make a difference. This is the time tonight to support LGBTQ initiatives at CTS. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. My name is Mac Buff. I use they, them pronouns, and I was the Castaneda Jennings Scholar for last year, 2021. It is my pleasure to bring us into the space together. I invite you to take a moment, get comfortable, pay attention to your breath. And this uh, poem comes from the organization Enfleshed, which provides queer inclusive liturgy. I invite you as you listen to bring to mind an image or several images of the divine that you hold dear. God is queer, as in strange, surprising, titillating, non-conforming to norms that destroy. God is queer, as in breaking open new possibilities through flesh entangled and brave acts of collective courage. God is queer, as in troubling certainties, resisting assimilation, and persisting through struggle together, as in interdependence, chosen family, and reaching out to isolated kin. God is queer as in always becoming, as in less this or that, and more multi-layered, multi-dimensional, and complex. God is queer as in intimately experienced and beyond definition, as in the love between strangers and sheets, the love that lasts for lifetimes, the love that begets love. God is queer as in resists white supremacy and all its deadening lies, rigid definitions and desire to control and confine, as in loyal to love, lovers, beloveds, even when it's all on the line. God is queer as in hurtful when spit from the mouth of hate, but sometimes still also a lighthouse, a history of holy uprising and a coming home from within. As we mm. listen tonight and we join together, I invite you to find the queerness of God and the divinity of queer folks, so may it be. Good evening. Uh, my name is Bo Myung So, uh, a member of the faculty at uh, Chicago Theological Seminary. Today, it is my honor uh, to introduce uh, this year's recipient of the Castaneda Jennings Award. The recipient is a student in our MDiv program, Leica Lewis Cornwell. I am especially happy to make this uh, public announcement uh, as uh, as I am uh, one who serves as LACA's academic advisor at CTS. The award was established uh, to honor openly gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, and queer students at Chicago Theological Seminary as an expression of, of the seminary's commitment uh, to the transformation of society toward greater justice and mercy. Each year we honor a student who embody that commitment in their work and vision. 
Leica intends to pursue a healing prophetic ministry in the Unitarian Universalist Church, advocating on behalf of the LGBTQ ministers and members, particularly those who are trans non-binary uh, folk who still face discrimination within congregational spaces. Leica is already actively engaged in that work as president of the UU Humanist Association. I am so thrilled that Leica is this year's recipient of the Castaneda Jennings Award, which has honored so many committed students of CTS since it was first established in 1994. Uh, and many of whom uh, are to this day continuing to fight uh, for God's justice and mercy in our society. Would you at this time uh, join me in congratulating uh, and celebrating Leica Lewis Conwell as this year's recipient of the Castaneda Jennings Award. <laughs> Uh, good evening and uh, congratulations, Leica. Uh, my name is Ken Stone. I'm also on the faculty here. Uh, I'm professor of Bible culture and hermeneutics. And uh, it is my great honor uh, tonight and pleasure to introduce our Castaneda Jennings lecturer. Uh, Dr. Ashan T. Crawley is a writer, artist, and teacher who explores the intersection of performance blackness, queerness, and spirituality. He currently holds the position of Associate Professor of Religious Studies and African American and African Studies at the University of Virginia. And his research and teaching experiences are uh, primarily in the areas of Black Studies, Performance Theory and Sound Studies, Philosophy and Theology, Black Feminist and Queer Theories. Uh, so quite an interdisciplinary uh, set of tools uh, and interests. Dr. Uh, Crawley is the author of the very highly regarded book, Black Pentecostal Breath, uh, The Aesthetics of Possibility, which has already become a resource for a number of our students, uh, and a more recent book, The Lonely Letters, which won the 2021 Lambda Literary Award in nonfiction. He's also working on several projects, including one about the role of the Hammond organ in the institutional and historical black church, in black sacred practice and in black social life more broadly. And tonight we look forward to hearing him speak on the topic, ghosts, music, black gospel, the fear of queerness and HIV AIDS, 1980 to 2005. Welcome, Dr. Crawley. Thank you for the lovely introduction. And thank you, thank you for the invitation to, to be the lecturer this year. I'm really moved and thankful and honored to be able to share with you all um, some work. And congratulations to, I believe it's pronounced Leica. Lika, yes. Lika, Lika. Thank you. I've been reading it the whole time, like, okay, okay. Lika, um, congratulations you. to you for winning the award. It's, you know, the work seemingly is never done, but the work when we share it with one another can be a joyful um, disposition because you are actually engaging in collective struggle for a more just, um, equitable and humane world. And so it's really a joy um, to be able to share with you uh, part of, of a project or set of projects that have been an ongoing curiosity for me, at least since the age of 13, 12, 12 or 13 years old, something happened in church. I will not describe it here, but something happened in church. And I remember it very, very clearly because it was the first time that I said, uh, the, the preacher isn't in charge of the church service. It's the musician here. It's, it's a there's something different about how power is being constituted. And for a very long time, trying to think about 
the musician in the place of um, sort of black churches. I grew up Pentecostal and what the place of the musician is when they're also lampooned as, or sort of stereotyped as queer. And so really trying to think about that intersection of queerness and the production of genius, it seems to me on um, specific instruments, even when people are only ear trained, when they don't know theory, they're still doing this kind of genius work, it seems to me. Um, and so I, I'm going to read because it's probably gonna be just that time. Um, I'm also gonna share this thing. Okay. Share screen. Okay. Um, ghost music, um, Black gospel, the fear of queerness and HIV AIDS, 1980 to 2005. Um, I'm reading from two different projects actually. And the hope is that for 30 minutes or so, I will read from a project that's titled Made Instrument, which is the more historical critical um, review of the Hammond organ as a history of contemporary black sexuality. I'm trying to make a very specific argument that attending to the Hammond organ and its role in the black church and the musician and how the musician gets talked about can actually give us a set of um, a ways to understand the sort of anxiety about what the concept of sexuality actually is doing. Um, and then I'll also read from um, two stories that are a part of what I think will be a novel um, that's titled Children and the Tales of Musicians, I think today, or it might be called Between the Sanctuary and the Parking Lot. There are a lot of different reasons why it might be one of two of those, which is a fictional rendering of musicians that played for black churches in the same years that Made Instrument is discussing. So 1980 to 2005, actually Made Instrument goes from 1935 to 2005 and so Children in the Tales of Musicians will also move from 1930-ish to 2005. Um, at the outset, I will say that I may cry during this talk. Um, the things that I've been trying to work through are actually really difficult. When I first started this project, it was not imagined as fictional at all. And so there was no fictional component. And when I first imagined the project, it was not about me. Um, the more that I wrote in the project that I thought was going to be a Hammond organ book, the more it became clear that I had to talk about how I felt as a young person experiencing the loss of so many musicians um, in and around New Jersey, to say nothing of in the country. And so I've presented different iterations of parts of this, and this is new stuff that I'm presenting tonight. But uh, I've cried several times, and um, it's who I am. I cried at the first talk that I ever gave. So I guess it's just really consistent at this point that this is who I am. Um, if I cry, it is for it, it is with the direction of a hope for a world otherwise than this, a world that is um, not occasioned by this kind of loss. Um, and just very quickly, I want to um, say something about the background image of this slide. Um, as I've been researching for both made instruments and children and the tales of musicians um, in ProQuest at the library, I kept getting all of these search results um, for classified ads um, when I searched the phrase Black church musician HIV, um, 1980, 2005. I kept seeing classified ad, classified ad, classified ad. And initially, um, I was very annoyed or initially I didn't notice. And then the more I kept scrolling, the more I realized that all that was being returned were classified ads. And so then I became annoyed because I wasn't really interested in classified ads. Why are classified ads showing up? I decided to click on one just to see what it was that these classified ads would have. And then when I clicked on it, I was stunned because um, in local newspaper after local newspaper in classified sections, these were black um, newspapers. Um, in, the in the local classifieds were ads for churches that were seeking musicians on one side of the page and um, ads for nonprofits, health organizations and organizations like that, seeking AIDS counselors, nurses and social workers, people who could work with people who are living with HIV literally on the other side of the page sometimes in the, in the next panel song, 
this one that you can probably see a little bit of new beginning deliverance church is seeking a Hammond organ is seeking an organist to play a Hammond organ on Sundays must be able to direct choir salary is negotiable can contact Deacon Primus on this part right next to it is part-time receptionist AIDS Resource Center Incorporated seeks a detail oriented et cetera et cetera et cetera it's not just this one ad it's like a whole lot of pages of classifieds. This is the history that I'm actually trying to contend with, the history that actually doesn't recognize the relationship between these classified ads and the history that doesn't recognize the history between the churches that are losing musicians. One of the ads very specifically says in 1993, seeking um, a woman who is middle-aged or young woman, like they are very specifically not seeking a man to play the organ for their church. And to me, that has a whole lot to do with what's happening at the time. And so I'm trying to deal with this sort of textured problem of unkindness um, in various kinds of ways. And so I'm reading from a nonfiction and then I'm reading um, from fiction. Okay. So the epigraph for tonight is the following. What makes a secret a secret? It really isn't who knows. Somebody always knows, usually a bunch of people outside of the secret holder. What makes a secret, what makes it a secret is that it cannot be spoken above a whisper without something breaking. An effort to zone where we place the yearnings that we don't know what to do with. Every time a pastor faces a scandal, remember that no one thinks these things don't happen, but many if not most think that they are supposed to be hidden. And as long as they're hidden, we are prohibited from creating more loving ways of being with one another. We aren't allowed that joy on the other side of secrecy. We cannot correct the imbalance and violence that happens in the shadows with shame, lashing out all over the one who is supposed to be beloved unless and until we decide the truth can be spoken. And that is Imani Perry. And so from Made Instrument section one, you have to imagine what it was like during my early adolescent years, the late 1980s, the early 1990s. We had a VCR and I used it to record and then rewatch all kinds of things, everything from episodes of Jim and the Holograms that are recorded toward one end of a particular video cassette so my parents would not know that I was watching a television show for girls, to episodes of Bobby Jones Gospel and sermons from local access television stations. Video cassettes helped me figure out what things in music I love. Video cassettes helped me to sense for how each of us differently, music stays with us, remains and endures. But two video cassettes helped me to notice how not everything stayed, how not everything remained, how not everything endured. There were disappearances too. And video cassettes captured that disappearance of sound made flesh a flesh made instrument. Father, pastor, mother, preacher, brother, musician, me, singer, we attended church almost daily. And we fellowship with lots of other churches, both in New Jersey and in New York, and also less frequently, other states as well. Members of the Church of God in Christ, my sense of belonging and community was felt because there were annual gatherings at our church, annual gatherings at other local churches, and annual gatherings in Memphis, Tennessee, the headquarters for the Church of God in Christ. One year, my parents attended the Holy Convocation in November, 1991, and my brother and I stayed behind in New Jersey with our uncle Thomas, my father's oldest brother. And because New Jersey public schools had its annual teachers convention through the New Jersey Education Association, I was able to stay at my uncle's house during the day for both Thursday and Friday. My brother had to go to school because he went to a Catholic school. My uncle had a lot of video cassettes from church services, gospel concerts, and live choir recordings. I watched one particular video of a choir from the Delaware Valley and I was moved. The song about being prepared for a difficult life but enduring the song about how nice it is to be on the Lord's side. The song about good news. I watched the video over and over again, but not because of the singing. Those two days I watched it over and over again because I could not believe what I was witnessing. Something still difficult for many to name because there still is so much shame. The leader of the choir, its director, was dying. It was apparent. Too young, he had an emaciated body, hair thin and balding, and at times a voice that would crack and stretch and leave. I knew he, quote, had AIDS, and knew too that he was a sinner and was very apparently gay. I knew these things about him because it was the early 90s. 
the video was released in 1991 and rumors and gossip circulated immaterial whispers and hushed conversations that were had about people that were here yesterday directing the choir playing the Hammond organ and leading solos sometimes all three today and gone quite literally tomorrow there were so many stories told about so and so and such and such so much so that I was as a young person afraid that something in the music was making these men queer and making them die. The gossip was supposed to protect families supposedly innocent from the stigma of having a sinful son, a sinful and dying son, grandson, nephew, cousin, or friend. But this silence, I'm sorry, but this rumor and gossip intensified the stigma for the musicians, the choir directors, and the singers. It was within this context that I was afraid to become a musician, choir director, or to really sing in the Black Pentecostal Church of my familiar, even though I loved the music, how it moved and made me, how it moved me and made me feel. But I, like so many others, even though I thought it was a gateway to sin, still moved toward the music. I was entranced, though, um, I was entranced um, through this choir director because he was there in the flesh of magnetic tape rendering image and sound, yet it felt like he was already gone. In the, mid in the middle of the video, during a protracted praise break, the choir director said the following. The doctor said I wouldn't live. The doctor said I wouldn't make it. I lost all this weight, didn't know what was going to happen. But I want you to know tonight I, that I give God praise. I want you to know tonight God is a healer. If you need healing, God is a healer. If you need deliverance, God is a deliverer tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I tell you this, this is for real. We not playing church. We may not live like you want us to live, but we love God. And this is a time that we have to, and this is a time that we need to stop playing church and just let God have his way, end quote. By 1992, the following year with the release of the subsequent recording, the choir director was dead, passed away in 1991. Section two. Sometimes the presence of ghosts is most intensely felt in music. A chord change, a beat drop, a bass note, a song fade, music and sound remain after in your flesh after vibrations are since registered and felt. Sometimes you hum it, sometimes it's simply stuck in your head, even if you hate it. Sometimes an occasion for nostalgia, you think about that girl you love, that boy you missed, the one you kissed. Sometimes a question, you sense and feel the edges of the song, the quality that it left with you, but its actual shape escapes like a faded picture in a broken dream. Whether a church's place in the history of Chicago and thus the history of black gospel music and thus and also the history of black popular music popular culture and indeed American culture, or the unspoken but real deaths of musicians, choir directors and singers, primarily, but not only men, to the HIV AIDS epidemic, especially in the 1980s and 90s, listening to music can be a haunting and daunting affair. I've always had an affinity for the sound of the Hammond organ. It haunts me like no other. It was heard in the video that I watched as a kid at my uncle's house, the sonic foundation against which the choir projected their voices, the sonic foundation within which the choir director announced the healing power of God. A lingering presence, the sound of the Hammond organ is backgrounded like a ghost in ghosting. Heard in the blues, jazz, rock and roll, R&B, funk, and soul, the sound of the Hammond organ's ubiquity for black folks begins in a church on Wabash Avenue in Chicago and genius not as identity, but as practice was created there and moved and then spread. With the invention of the Hammond organ in the 1930s, black musicians performances helped to make it the first commercially successful, successfully marketed electric instrument. They harnessed its currents and spin to practice joy and vibrancy and spirit. They played it in ways the inventor, Lawrence Hammond surely would have hated pulling out all the draw bars, making the sound as loud and as grating as possible. Perhaps the music that they made in general would have been hated because it was so black. Once working with Birth of, the Nation, Birth of a Nation's D.W. Griffith, after he created the film, um, was released, it is curious that Hammond's name is remembered not for the prototype for 3D glasses that he invented, but for an instrument popularized by Black folks a conundrum as American as apple pie. 
Angela Davis says that a unique contribution Black folks make in a post-emancipation world from Jim Crow onward is in music. She demonstrates how Black folks explored with intention and explicitness eroticism and sexuality. But this exploration and explicitness were experiments in thought, experiments in practice of relation and possibility full of uncertainty. From novel depictions written by James Baldwin in which the musician character is the symbol for the propulsive energy of eroticism and sin in Go Tell It On A Mountain, to the depictions of the Philadelphian church organist as effectively in love with the queer teenager on his way to Paris in Langston Hughes' short story, Blessed Assurance. The meaning of black church pianists and organists has seemingly always been a question of existential concern. It is within this context of experimentation in and across genres that I place the playing of the Hammond organ. Hammond organists within a black church context along with choir directors like the one from the Delaware Valley and singers too were transformed into a sign and symbol of this new exploratory and experimental thinking in the early 20th century. Such that black church musicianship on the Hammond organ is one way we might sense the ghostly matters of experiments and explorations. Musicians are conduits letting us feel the ephemeral and immaterial. Because in their practice, they help us to sense haunting, the lingering presence of possibility, movement beyond the limit of intention, of desire, of doctrine. I think about core changes and progressions, the arpeggios and modulations Hammond organists play. For me, a certain playing always got and still gets up in my flesh, the sounds moving through the intention of my desired control decorum and control, showing my flesh to be porous and open and available for urging, for incitement to praise. Sometimes I would, after hearing a chord progression that was felt viscerally jump up from a seat or a pew, throw my hands up, getting happy, leap in joy, shout in praise, worship in, in ecstasy. And it was never just me. The Hammond organist, when skilled, enraptures those that feel the instrument's vibrations, their sounds carrying and caressing, the movements of the musician's hands and feet through key changes and modulations, coaxing and convoking and arousing. That they can coax, convoke and arouse excites preachers wanting to move the congregation to praise. But this capacity for movement also worries, fascinates and terrifies. Because if congregants can be moved to praise, can they also be moved towards the vulgar and the sinful? And what to do with a musician that shows the spirited nature of preaching is produced with relation to the sound that they are producing. A Hammond organist skills when fully realized always felt to me like holy terror and dread. Not because what, not because what they were playing wasn't moving. It always felt like terror and dread because I detected in such playing an expansiveness, a non-colonizing increase that was uncontrollable and uncontainable like the first kiss shared between boys, knowing hell is real and possible and there with the kiss, but they do it anyway, like existence. The sounds made by the Hammond organist compel non-coercive movement, a suggestion for pleasure you didn't know you wanted to have until you were in the middle of it, in the atmospheric pressure of it, sensing, sensing yourself being made otherwise within it. A leap in the flesh, it feels so good. Who knew a kiss? a sound could be like this. Who knew power didn't have to be coercive or violent, but could be, but could be a practice of sharing with one another, reciprocity. Not power held as private property, but power shared as joy and breath and becoming. Musicians playing the Hammond have a terribly beautiful opportunity to make folks sense beyond the edges of the material world and help us to sense and share delight and joy in such a beyond that is also right here, right there made in the material world. And they help us to share delight and joy even when pondering the nature of reality is scary. They help us celebrate uncertainty as principle, as disposition, as a fact of creaturely existence. Yet they, the musicians of my concern, were not loved. Lampooned in comedy, attacked and sermonizing the music in the black church with the Hammond organist, the male choir director, and the male soloist as carriers of tradition emerged in the early 20th century as a repository for the idea of men failing masculinity, manhood, fatherhood, and patriarchy. Stereotyped, but no less real in their practice, these purported failures stood in for a range of queer possibilities, possibilities functioning like apparitional weight, there was the presence of queerness in black churches from the beginning, 
but also the disavowal and the renunciation of such possibility. The love of the flamboyant singer, the gaudy jewelry of the musician, but also the refusal to think his presence as possibility. The songs of these musicians still sung and rehearsed and performed today, even when these musicians succumb to the crisis of an epidemic, their music haunts. What does the haunting want of us? It wants us, I think, to ask about how genius happens because some opine that it is the condition of violence that created the occasion for their blooming and flowering. Some offer that it's okay, the harmful rhetoric, the kicking out from family, the rejection and physical violence, because that is the suffering they had to endure to become close to God in order to create this music. But the haunting that, the haunting that remains wants us to interrogate because these unnamed but very real musicians did not only or perhaps even primarily play out of duress or even the very real fear of a biological fact of a not easily understood virus. But it seems to me they, they performed because of love, because of friendship and because they were good. And that they might be, and that might be the most heartbreaking part that they were practicing life, but such life was not enough to have congregants really wrestle with the fact of the presence of queerness and death as the possibility to practice life with one another. These musicians found one another, however, learned and taught and pushed one another. Their musicianship craft developed because they loved one another. Labor there, but flesh forgotten, labor apparent, but flesh demeaned, dismissed and discarded. What does it mean to be a musician of this instrument? Section three, we had to have taken route 87 north because that is the route one would have taken to get from East Orange, New Jersey to Quebec City. I was in junior high school, my second year in the eighth grade. It was my, it was, I was in the junior high school band, played the drums, though I mostly hated the exercises and didn't like practicing. I wasn't much good at it, but I was trying to learn to be made instrument for our church slash slash my father wanted me to play the drums. I sold Katie Diz for the church fund, I mean, for the school fundraiser. Mr. Patuto, our band teacher, wanted us to experience the world with a bus trip to Canada. I didn't have to pay because I sold the most. I don't recall, mo most, most, I don't recall much of the trip. Some very immature teen jokes with me and my roommates, my ordering Mugu Gai Pan from a Chinese restaurant in Canada and people laughing at it, though I still maintain that it tastes good. And the cassettes. I'd gotten a, a Sony Walkman for Christmas, maybe the year previous, and I took it everywhere with me. My friend Edward went to another Black Pentecostal church in East Orange, though they were oneness and not Trinitarian, so my then 13-year-old self very likely thought that they were going to hell anyway. But he let me borrow two cassettes, and I listened to them incessantly, those seven hours going up and eight hours returning to New, to New Jersey. Both were Ronald Winans, Family and Friends Choir, Volumes 3 and then 2. The order, the three and then the two is important because I listened to the former, the three first. The cover featuring, the cover featuring um, a photo of a dark skin and beautiful Ronald in a deep purple suit jacket, a lavender shirt, head tilted, shy smile. A simple cover, this photo framed with a kind of, um, the photo framed with a kind of lilac, lilac, lavender on one side, a kind of soft orange on the other. It was enough for me to listen. You Don't Know was a particularly moving song, a funky rhythmic um, tune with Dorinda Clark Cole on the lead. A song of consecration too with Ronald and his brother trading on the lead was beautifully inspiring to me. Asking questions like I've never asked before. Expecting answers that will unlock every door to a new and a living way to serve them better in the future is the reason I'm here today mm -hmm. seeking God in a very sad way Taking heed To the things I do and I say 
Apparently, I'm sharing the wrong version of the screen, but it's really about listening. So actually, it's OK, y'all. Um, I appreciate y'all telling me, though. But it's seeing this doesn't actually, you just see the five slides that I'm doing. I appreciate it. Um, you have to imagine a 13-year-old Black boy with a strong sense of the spiritual, a deep desire to be holy and sanctified, a hope for a clean future hearing these words and listening to them over and over again because that 13 year old black boy kept feeling feelings that he knew he'd have to deny of and in himself in order to have a personal relationship with Jesus. It's as if the song named a longing, but also an action the boy would have to undergo, full and complete denial of desire and joy that he'd feel as the butterflies in his stomach whenever he thought of that one boy or that other boy. Such delightfulness led to so many tears. He kept rewinding and rewinding and listening again and again Maybe he could slip into the song itself, inhabit it. Maybe the friend asked for the tape and exchanged that volume three for volume two. I liked that one more because it felt more churchy. Um, there was the sound of the Hammond organ that was much more pronounced and felt and warm on the volume two. This volume two was released two years previous in 1989. And the person that played the Hammond organ for her sisters in Detroit, Michigan, asking if their living was in vain, I talk about this in a different chapter, sang with the famous um, Detroit gospel family, The Winans, on this album. On volume two is a song titled The Word of God. In the reprise, um, Twinkie Clark famously sings the following. Oops. Why I remember if you weren't holy in the choir, you couldn't sing. But now we go for almost anything. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We changed. Can I do the other part? I'm Remember when women were women? Uh oh. Men were men. And now you can't hardly. You 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 can't hardly. You 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 can't hardly. You have to imagine again a 13 year old black boy with a strong sense of the spiritual, a deep desire to be holy and sanctified, a hope for a clean future hearing these words and listening to them over and over again. Because that 13 year old black boy kept feeling things he knew he'd have to deny of and in himself in order to have a personal relationship with Jesus. He felt something of the holy that he wanted to be but was not there because of doctrine because of his shameful and unspoken sin, his desire that he did not ask for, but certainly emerged as an ongoing uncertainty. 
It's as if the song named a longing that he would have to denounce, a conflation of gender and sexuality and not living up to the role God desired that God required. A song that even with laughter had a 13 year old black boy consider what he would have to undergo, a full and complete denial of desire and joy that he'd feel as the butterflies in his stomach whenever he thought of that one boy or that other. Such delightfulness led to so many tears. Recorded in Detroit, the song documents the shadow of displacement and violence because what is happening in Detroit in the 1980s and the early 1990s for such a bold claim of failure to live the correct gendered position to happen? Why did these lyrics produce laughter instead of an ethical crisis? Twinkie's laughter veils and hides from view the refusal to contend with the presence of difference and what the presence of difference meant for the whole of community. Because for her, there was a time when women were women and men were men, but now you can hardly tell her from a hymn. Anthony Hilbert's The Gospel Sound, Good News and Bad Times records a bit of this for us. Quote, most immediately striking about many of the larger holiness churches is the inordinate number of male and female homosexuals. As one singer bluntly put it, there's more sissies and bull daggers in the sanctified churches, and they all think they're the only ones going to heaven, end quote. Curious, this quote, but also telling. Published initially in 1971, this reflection on the inordinate number means that there was a series of questions and contestations and allowances of Black queer life before that publication. They were not invented, queer folks, in 1971 or 1983 or 1989, even though Twinkie Clark feels differently. It's not a conflation of gender and sexual orientation, what Twinkie named. It seems to me what she is marking is the crisis that both gender and sexual orientation produce or allow for us to sense and notice with a kind of clarity. So instead of thinking that what she is naming is a reductive understanding of gender that somehow is collapsed with the idea of sex, what she names and announces through giggling call to raucous laughter response is the anxiety about the uncertainty of both concepts. It's not that women were women and men were men and they are confused. It's that women were men, women and men were men and those that presume these categories to be unalterable and unmalleable are confused and thrown into crisis. The laughter is a renunciation of possibility, the renunciation of relation, the renunciation of uncertainty. In 1989 in Detroit, there were 503 HIV diagnoses, 175 deaths, 302 AIDS diagnoses and 167 deaths, and approximately 27% of the new cases were Black people. The laughter from the queen of the Hammond B3 enunciates an abandonment of community interior to Black social life. Maybe the sound, maybe the performance practices and the stories, maybe the rumors and the hushed conversation and gossip is an archive of an unsettled history, an, ar an archive of the dead that wander amongst us. They lived, they labored, they are lost. This is a love letter. Okay, really quickly, section three. I wanna read a small bit of the fiction after this. I did not remember the words of the choir director from the 1991 video recording as I began to research to write this book, but I remembered the repetition of the rewatching, the awe and the disbelief. I hadn't watched as an adult for at least 25 years though I could easily recall how it felt. This musician choir director left an impression on me, an immaterial mark in sadness too. So seeing his flesh speak those words about weight loss and incredulous doctors and God's healing power stunned me and made me remember. Because the kinds of people that were disappearing were the kinds of people I knew I had an affinity with, even though I did not want to be like them or like that. Because the church said that they were sinners and an abomination. Perhaps I was those things too. At 12 years old, I was afraid that the Delaware Valley Choir Director's fate would be my fate too. There were so many others that I knew and did not know that were dying. Writing about this specific patch of land of approximately 2000 square miles, journalist Rhonda Graham in 1994 stated the following, quote, since 1991, at least 14 singers and musicians have died between Middletown and Philadelphia, a regional circuit for gospel musicians. In Kent County, about 10 singers and musicians and civilian choirs have, and churches have died since 1990, end quote. A small community in four years loses 24 performers, folks that no doubt were active in their church homes, were friends and had family. How do the ones that are integral to a way of life get disappeared? 
1992 album cover, an image of the now deceased choir director hovers over the choir. The image is opacity at maybe 60%, such that you can see through him, his flesh now literally porous and ghostly. From the 1992 album, I, as a 12 year old, listened to With Intention and Fear, a song about being thankful for God's mercy. The song is a long form lament regarding the various things the person singing it did wrong in their life, but also about how they needed to be a better person and change their behavior. But what did this mean to a 12 year old who was at the time terrifyingly really experiencing attractions that were uncontainable and unexplainable, but also undeniable? I listened on that Walkman to the one song about mercy over and over again because I hoped I would not die with thoughts of a boy, to, uh, with thoughts of a boy in my head or like that choir director did. How to tell the story that needs to be told but struggles being told precisely because there is no easy way to tell it. How many musicians was it? A question often posed to me when trying to discuss the massive loss Black churches endured during, um, due to the virus during this time. Asked by some because there's a general disbelief in the fact that there was this kind of loss in the first place. Asked by others because they think that the loss doesn't mean anything meaningful. And asked by others because they think I'm making it up. What to do about the fact that it is not quantified, the loss, and that the lack of quantification is itself the evidence of ghosting and silencing. And though the life of even one loss is incalculable, I'm not talking about the loss of a singular individual. I'm talking about the heartbreak that emerges from the loss of a person that is a site of connection. Someone that laughed and joked and had heartbreak, a cousin, a nephew, a grandson, someone that went to diners and midnight musicals, but also the loss of the sounds that they made and the music they could have created but did not create because they were not cared for. I'm trying to tell the difficult story and how the difficult story feel, feels. I'm trying to hear the sounds of what they could have done had they lived and been cared for. The dead are unsettled and remain with us and endure because they experience casual violence of dismissal and distance and general unkindness. Many died alone, family and friends, church members afraid of and refusing to visit the one that provided for the music an occasion for praise, a soundtrack for worship. They haunt because the fullness of their stories have not been told, the fullness of their life worlds, their experiences, their loves and their sadnesses have not been given breath or rest. They haunt because they have not been given proper ceremony and in lacking proper ceremony, they have not been severed from this world. They remain with us in unsettled history. You have to understand this is not the story that I thought I was going to tell. I thought I was going to write a simple cultural history regarding the Hammond organ and its use in black churches. But what is a cultural history and what is the relationship between the cultural and the historical and the way we come to understand ourselves and our place in the world? I began to wonder more and more as I wrote this project, what was what was it that I was trying to actually say? And what was I actually trying to discover? And so what you have or what you have heard um, is not what I initially planned to write, but what you have are the questions that continue to unsettle me. I'm trying to tell the story that needs to be told that is difficult to tell. And so um, that's from the, the nonfiction. This um, two very short reflections is from the fiction. Um, Children in the Tales of Musicians. This is from a section titled Brian. Well, I heard he cried more than anybody else. The implication was clear. Brian was close to Jamal and there was lots of rumor and gossip about what they meant to each other. This was true even before Jamal died. Pneumonia, you know, that disease. It was whispered, but that's the end of their story. It did not begin this way. It was at that church service in 1984 that they met. Brian, the last Sunday in August of 1984, was asked to preach at an afternoon youth service. It was a back to school theme and he, now 23, had begun to really make a name for himself in Philadelphia as a sought after youth minister. His phone rang off the hook after his sermon the previous year. Folks all across Pennsylvania were impressed with him. Therefore, in addition to his work at Aramark and night classes at Community College of Philadelphia, he was preaching lots of weekends. This Sunday was no different than the others. When entering the church building, he was immediately in its vestibule. He could hear the music a bit muffled because of the closed door, felt it, the music really. Brian tried not to arrive late to church, especially when he had to preach. He enjoyed services, everything from the opening song to the benediction. And this service wouldn't be different. He heard and felt it in the vestibule. 
he stood and listened as the sang as the saints sang a testimony song. The sounds of hand clapping, a foot stomping of tambourines, of the pulse provided by the drummer, and Jamal on the Hammond, who Brian did not yet know. He was impressed with what he heard, especially with the organist. He could tell the sermon that he was readying to preach, we will make it, would land well there because the music was already setting the atmosphere. He knew they'd have a good time because of the sounds of the hand claps he heard, the chord changes on the Hammond, and the hollers from the church folks. There was such an inviting and praise-inducing atmosphere. As he was about to enter, the usher whispered, she's going she's to pray, and closed the door again. Then he heard her. When Bishop Juanita Bradford prayed, pastor of Praise Deliverance Tabernacle, is when he knew. He didn't know what he knew, but there was a sort of familiarity and comfort in the way the musician carried her voice, strong, textured contralto. But it wasn't alone, there was the music. He felt something stirring in him because of the relation between her voice on the microphone, the sound of the saints in reply, and the chord changes in arpeggios on the Hammond. The musician replied to every line and word with precision. It was moving. Brian was moved. Praise Deliverance Tabernacle is an apostolic Pentecost church, oneness or Jesus only, um, as his father, Brian's father, would have said. His father actually refused to go because, according to him, they were in, er in doctrinal error, though it can't be said that he ever really supported Brian, though Brian did everything he could to prove to his daddy that he was the right kind of son, the right kind of man, the right kind of preacher. Praise Deliverance was known for his music. They'd had many recordings and musicals there, though, though most Kojic folks um, refused to go there even, um, most Kojic folks ref refused to go to events there because um, they had plenty of events of their own. But Brian always wanted to preach there. He'd heard whispers about a young organist um, being there, but he'd never heard him, never heard the music. So he wasn't expecting who he saw when he saw him. One of the young folks was at the Commonwealth Summer Convocation and heard Brian preach there, went back to the pastor and said they had to have him for service. This was that service. Bishop Juanita Bradford began her prayer softly and gently. And now I'm going to play a clip of someone whose name was Bishop Iona Locke, um, who was in Detroit, Michigan, who sounds like the person that I'm trying to think about. And the organist who's playing behind her sounds like what I'm sort of thinking about. There is no other God beside you. It's in you that we live and move and have our beings. He have called us from all parts of the earth. Yeah. Yeah. More importantly, all parts of the body of Christ to witness, to witness and celebrate choice and elevation. Father, we have been summoned by you, with, which is such an esteemed privilege to be here. Name by name and rank by rank. We thank you for your son that is getting ready to be prince. Gracious and holy father, stretch out your hand. Lay pillars in his being. I'm, I'm going to move on. I could play the whole thing, but I'm gonna move on because of time. Um, the musician played behind her called Nothing Music. Nothing Music is the sound from which all music that happens in the sanctuary emerges. The musician might be playing this talk music and when it's time for a hymn to be sung, they will pull out the draw bars, um, the metal sliders that are used to control pitch and volume of the Hammond organ, sculpting the sound immediately changing the sonic force of the instrument. And after the music recedes, draw bars pushed in to add a soft caress to sound. It is a staging from which emerges the various songs and sounds that will be heard throughout the practice of the church service in the space. This continued the movement between the saints, Bishop Juanita Bradford and the musician on the Hammond. When she finished praying saying amen, 
With the saints clapping, the usher opened the door and invited Brian into the sanctuary. He looked not for the pulpit, but for the organ. He wanted to see, he wanted to see who was playing the instrument. His eyes were locked because he'd never felt what he'd felt listening to the music. But Jeanette grabbed his hand in attention. <clears throat> they walked in together, the usher leading them to the front of the sanctuary. What Brian most enjoyed and what he most noticed during the duration of the church service was the music Jamal would play between things, the nothing music that he used while the saints were praising. The sounds made something within him leap. After the singing, after the praise, after the offering, after the announcements, after his being introduced, Brian stood up to preach. And when he preached because of the energy that the service already had, he was ready. The sounds of softness carried him. As he thanked Bishop Juanita Bradford and the good people of Praise Deliverance Tabernacle for the invitation, Jamal played this talk music, this padding and these nothing changes. And Brian felt a kind of release of anxiety and nervousness in the sound, the sound giving his voice a soft place to dwell. Jamal's courting followed. After the pleasantries, Brian said, since I'm a little bit nervous, sing with me, saints. My soul loves Jesus, my soul loves Jesus, my soul loves Jesus, bless his name. My soul loves Jesus, my soul loves Jesus, my soul loves Jesus, bless his name. Thing is, Brian almost never sang publicly, not because his voice wasn't sure, but because he was not sure of it. Um, he hated his voice, he was fearful of it. He felt his voice escape him whenever he sang and it would almost drag into intensity that he could not control. A voice on the edge and verge of tears. It'd be like the song and sound would draw itself out from his flesh forcefully like the breath was a gush and a rush. He hated that feeling because he felt disrobed and exposed, felt like whomever listened could and would detect what he doctrinally and theologically considered to be his defect. But Jamal, Brian felt his courting, heard and felt wrap around his words, caress and through gentleness hold them, released in him a desire to scream reflexively almost. It's like the organist found a register of playing that matched and anticipated and followed behind what he was saying and feeling and attempting to do. It was the sound of love. Brother organist, you're making me want to sing, but I got to preach. He searched for songs so he could for a little bit longer linger in sonic embrace. He kept singing. He's a wonder in my soul. He's a wonder in my soul. He's a wonder in my soul. Bless his name. He's a wonder in my soul. He's a wonder in my soul. He's a wonder in my soul. Bless his name. Jamal never skipped a beat from the moment Brian sounded out the first my soul. Jamal was there chords with Brian. It's like he knew without knowing what he'd sing, that he was singing out the nervousness, that the sound, those nothing changes were a kind of bed in which he could find refuge. Refuge in sound and song. This is what the musician, the gift of black sound and song achieves. Brian kept going. Y'all know I'm from the church of God in Christ, but I hope y'all know this song too. Brother organist and a flash of something in his eye and a flash of something familiar in Jamal's then Sing with me, saints. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. If you love him, say yes. It's like the singing was the practice of surrender to chance and opportunity. It was there, something. The flash, the, the, dark, the dark brightness, the shimmering quiet. They, Brian, Jamal, and maybe Jeanette too, felt it. Brian released himself into the sound, felt like he was himself secreted into the sound, like he found in Jamal's playing retreat, refuge, and rest. It was momentary, barely there, but there were, si there, was si there were sighs of release in his voice, sighs as a sign and symbol of what was to come if only he had the fortitude to endure, if only. He eventually stopped singing and began his preaching. Jamal quieted the instrument, pushed in the drawbars, took his foot off the bass pedals and rested his back against the wall. It's almost like the folks could feel Jamal's intrigue in the way he held himself back from playing like he normally does how he played for um, how he played for and with Brian was beautiful but it was controlled it was nothing like the out and out flat-footed playing he would typically do he was nervous and he didn't know why even though he did he didn't want to know why but he also felt the command Brian was able to have with the congregation was not the first intrigue it was the shyness the tentative way he approached the singing if Brian felt something leap when listening, Jamal felt the leap leap in him and so was moved and leaped too. Butterflies. It was just butterflies and recognition, all in how they were with one another. One could notice it, but one had to not notice it because they, I'm sorry, because the church said it was wrong anyway. 
So they placed all that energy and intensity and things and practices that could be way stations, holding ports, if and hopefully until something changed that could um, allow them to properly release it. At the end of the sermon, Brian began to hoop and Jamal followed along, backing him up on the instrument with dexterity and drive. It felt good to Brian their relational play through words and chords. But as he was preaching, hooping the close of his sermon, there was one moment when Jamal was notably silent and retreated. Brian said, our God is greater, right? Greater than Buddha, greater than Krishna, greater than Allah, greater than Muhammad. Brian felt it, a momentary eclipse of sound from the hymn, and he felt a pronounced silence, barely there. Whatever it was, he registered it quickly and changed gears. After the service, Brian introduced himself to Jamal. I've never preached like that shaking his hand. There was ever so briefly a lingering in the handshake. Jeanette affirmed, no, he really has never preached like this. It was the music. Jamal demurred, it wasn't nothing tonight. Just a couple of things here and there. You preach good though. Brian felt something like a rainstorm forming in his mind and chest as they shook hands. Jamal heard the wind and the trickle and splatter on the window pane. Brian felt and sensed the sounds that moved him to praise as he preached. He didn't, want the, he didn't want to allow the thought to go here, but it was right there on the edge. Jamal's flesh was receptive to the sound of the abundance of rain. It's supposed to rain tonight, he said. It wasn't in the forecast, but it did. I am going to skip real quick, because this part is important. Um, they went to a diner after the church service together. Um, Broadway restaurant on 52nd Street, as the saints often do after church services. Though Jamal was only 20, he was a student at Temple University in his second year studying electrical engineering during the day, grew up in North Philly. They all roared with laughter, talking about church folks and music. They sang songs and play shouted. They were young and happy and enjoying each other's company. Brian and Jamal and Jeanette, but also Corinthia and LaShawn. While the girls were talking, Jamal sitting next to Brian whispered, Maybe you shouldn't say that stuff about Muhammad and Allah. My old head is Muslim and a lot of my cousins are too. This is Philly, you can't be saying that. Jamal wasn't wrong. The blues retains a relationship in a, in a mode of collective consciousness to Islam. Jamal was a mystic, even if he didn't know it. He was able to sense relation. His playing on the hymn and articulated the hidden cultural and spiritual resource of Islam in black. It's felt in the blues and black Christian prayer and in taking it to church. Without knowing directly what it was that he was doing, what made Jamal such a good musician was the way he was able to hear and then play on the ham in those relationships. Or not really hear, but detect and sense what the sounds and supposedly disparate traditions and communities made available for him. He loved his father, Ishmael. His mother, Anne, grew up Black Pentecostal, and they went to a Baptist church after a short stint in Buddhism and Jehovah's Witnessing, too. She took the Shahada, not for Ishmael, but she ain't stayed when they broke up either. Both his grandmothers on his father's side and mothers were Black Pentecostal. His father's father was an atheist bluesman and his mother's father was a little bit of everything and nothing, mostly Catholic. Bishop Juanita Bradford was not only his pastor and auntie, she was his godmother too. And his other aunt Arletta grew up in the Black, um, grew up Black Pentecostal but is now part of the AME church. His twin sister Janet, who did all those conversions too, was the love of his life. His other siblings, less so. Jamal and his family was Black Philly, in other words. That was the first time they'd hang out. It would not be the last. Uh, they went to the church together. They start hanging out, learning how to play the organ together. Um, Brian asked Jamal to teach him one of the songs on the Hammond organ. They used the 1984 Hallelujah Anyhow Thomas Whitfield album. Um, as they sat in the church, um, Jamal thought for a moment and then began to play the intro for a song that's titled God is on our side. Um, not a song that Brian thought he'd play because it was a B-side song, but it made sense for the mood um, and it made sense for the mood that they were in. He, Jamal, sang as well as he played. His talent was limitless and earnest, no malice, no ego. He just wanted to be an instrument. As he sang the words, God said, he'll comfort, so tell me why am I afraid? Brian began to cry hard, sitting on the organ stool next to Jamal. Jamal kept singing, but a tear fell from his closed eye too. 
It was the vulnerability of the moment that moved them, a kind of felt intimacy that charged and pulsed between them as Jamal played but did not look at the keys or at Brian. It was prompted by how Jamal reflexively and without intention, though certainly with desire, put his hand on Brian's lower back as they walked into the church moments earlier. Having done it, they both felt a sort of charge and shock, a brief barely there and almost unexhaled and unbreathed pause and giggle too. Something happened, some something between. They didn't comment on it, the gesture, but it hung in the air and contributed to their awkwardness. It's what led to their mutual tears. It had been months of seeing each other. Brian um, could not initially admit to Jamal, let alone to himself, that he cried because he was in love. They had not even yet kissed, but every moment that every moment and movement that they spent together was felt deeply in his flesh. And so it went. I'm going to end there. I'm going to end there. I'm going to end there. Um, thank you for letting me share some of this work with you all. Thank you very much, Dr. Powell. The, uh, the way you write in both non-fictional and fictional modes really intrigues me. And uh, I, I will start with a question there and then we'll open it up to, the, to others. Uh, but I do want to thank you first for sharing these, these works, uh, especially as you're still working on them. And it's always, it's always nice to be with someone who's thinking things out uh, as, as, and lets us think with you. But I wonder what uh, fiction provides for you that the, the nonfiction writing, the nonfiction writing does not. And, and, and also the process, how is the process different? Um, thank you for that question. I think that what the nonfiction does is it frees me to be just a little bit more playful than the, um, than the, um, the fiction allows me to be more playful than the nonfiction um, and allows me to be more sort of engaging in magical realism and perhaps some fantasy too. Uh, there will be literal ghosts in the fiction um, in ways that um, I'm sort of thinking about and trying to theorize about in the nonfiction. And so it, the, the, for me, they're, they're, they actually were not different projects initially. They were actually the same project. Um, initially was going to be a chapter that was a sort of historical critical chapter. And then there would be like a fictional fictionalized tale of a musician um, who's based on a whole bunch of composite or who's a composite based on a whole bunch of people that I actually know um, and people that I've researched. And the more I kept reading, or sorry, the more I kept um, researching and writing, um, couple of people who I trust would say, I think you have two, not different, but you have two different things here. Um, mm -hmm. Or you have things that can be separated out. You have this fiction that can be like just the stories um, of these musicians and you have this historical critical book too. And they can accomplish similar kinds of things, but they can be for different audiences or there can be overlap. And so for me, it just becomes a different kind of forum to think through a lot of the same conditions, but it, it gives me a little bit more flexibility and latitude to, you know, work literally with ghosts and, and how ghosts are going to be present. And, um, and so that for me is what fiction can allow me to do. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, and for others, uh, you can either ask a question directly or uh, put it in the chat, uh, but let's have a little time of conversation. I hope you're also seeing the compliments that are coming in the chat. <laughs> I do. Thank you all. I really appreciate it. Uh, this is Adrian, Dr. Crowley. Okay, so <laughs> I grew up on this Pentecostal, and everything you to describe was clearly spot on. Um, also, I agree that it was haunting and beautiful. And boy, I want to read everything that you put in writing. I do. <laughs> uh, one question that lingers for me is around the connection of Islam mm. and the music yeah. and to that of not just the blues, but to, to gospel music. So are you willing to share a little bit more about that? Yeah. Um, I think I was first prompted by the idea through, I think I was reading um, 
uh, Reverend Jeremiah Wright's uh, either master's thesis or dissertation where he's talking about like this connection. And it was very, um, it wasn't sort of elaborated at all, but um, it was there uh, that there's this relationship between Islam and like, you know, the sound of, of like gospel music. And I'm like, okay, what does that mean? And so the more I'd researched, the more I was finding the relationship that several musicologists have um, elaborated for us between Islam, the sound of the Adan, the call to prayer, and what you hear in the blues. And so one example is um, a song called The Levy Camp Holler, which was recorded at um, Parchment State Prison in Louisiana by Alan Lomax. Um, and this is one of the primary songs that they use to say, if one listens to the, the way there is this call and response with the, the lead singer and his usage of melisma, which is taking one syllable and breaking it over multiple notes and the way that he's sort of bending notes, that this sounds a lot like what's happening um, for the folks who are uh, stolen from Western Africa who are either Muslim or are in close intimate contact with Muslims in West Africa such that they know uh, the sonic practices of Islam, even if they're not Muslim, that there is this relation, there's this relationship that you can draw between Islam and the blues. And I'm like, if that's the case, then why wouldn't it be the case with gospel? Like, because one colloquial way that people talked about gospel when I was growing up was that, oh, the gospel music, I'm sorry, the blues is just gospel with different lyrics. And it's like, not untrue because of the blue note. And like, and the repetition. And, and so like, I, I started to listen to like Christian prayer and like lit and like in black churches. And so listening to a charge to keep, I have, or um, listening to devotion in general and just saying like, is there something here that's going on? And it's not the same at all, but there are some resonances between, I think the ways black Christian folks have come to understand what the prayer, what the posture of prayer is supposed to mean sonically and its relation to this Islamic practice of what prayer is supposed to mean. And so like, I'm not like, I have to keep saying like, I'm not saying that the Muslim call to prayer is a song at all, even though some people would like collapse it into, I'm like, I'm not making an argument that it's a song. What I'm trying to argue is that there is a very specific sort of understanding of sound as producing a kind of relation with the sacred that gets carried through these various traditions. And so one can listen to, um, you know, devotion in Black Baptist churches. One can listen to tarry services in Pentecostal services. And you'll hear like, oh, wait, there is, there is this thing that is consistent. And so, you know, what I'm saying about Jamal, I mean, like, and so when I lived in Philly, I went to this church as a choir director for the New Spirit of Penn Gospel Choir. And this musician was amazing, amazing. It was a Baptist church. And as he's leaving, I asked him like, oh, like, are you Kojic? Because a good little Kojic uh, chauvinism means everybody that's a good musician is Kojic, apparently. And he kept going, he said, I'm a Muslim Pentecostal and kept walking. And, and this was like before, like I started thinking about any stuff. I was like, oh, this man is confused. How could you be that? That don't make no sense. And then like finding out that like Philadelphia, like really, Philadelphia is like, it's a, it's a black Muslim city and it don't matter if you Muslim or not. It's a black Muslim city. And I love, it's like one of my favorites is I'm writing a book about Philadelphia and spirituality because of this, because there is a set of, I, I met someone, I went on a date with someone who's like, I'm Jehovah's Witness and Muslim. And I'm like, don't, none of this makes sense, except who am I to say that it, don't, it makes sense to you? So it does. And so like actually finding people negotiating relationships to spiritual practice that a whole bunch of people say, you can't do that. It's a whole bunch of people there. They're like, no, nah, I'm doing it. And so when I say Jamal is black Philly, what I'm trying to say is that his life world is so deeply influenced by like these various traditions, but specifically like black practices of Islam. And like, and so he's not willing to let people talk badly about the Muslims just because he's in a church. He's like, no, we don't do that here. Like, and so I'm not gonna play if you say something um, about folks who are like my cousins and my and my father, you know. So that's 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 the thing that I'm trying to say there. Yeah. 
Thank you for the question. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Colley, there's another question in the chat about saying a little bit more about the instrument itself and particularly what's distinctive about the B3. Um, I mean, it's what is it's I mean, it, it's different from a lot of things, but I think that the primary thing that Lawrence Hammond was trying to do was to create a cheap replacement for pipe organs and it was a failure. Um, he, he thought that he could manufacture a cheap or an inexpensive replacement for pipe organs for churches that could not afford pipe organs because pipe organs you have to construct into the building. And so you have to have space in order to have a pipe organ. And the Wurlitzer wasn't uh, and is not a good sonic replacement for the pipe organ. And because of his, it was the Hammond organ clock or it was the Hammond clock company um, because he manufactured clocks. And his uh, manufacturing of clocks gave him this insight into the way he could actually produce an organ. And so it was initially supposed to be a replacement for um, pipe organs, but the difference between like a pipe organ and a Hammond organ is that it, it responds to touch too quickly, that it's touch to response ratio is too fast. And what that means is that as soon as you touch it, it responds and it doesn't matter the, um, the intensity of the touch, it will make the same sound. And so it's not like a piano where if you touch it, if you press down harder, it makes a louder sound. It's not produced like that. And so it actually frees musicians who are playing the Hammond um, mechanical instruments to do other kinds of mechanics with the instrument. And so because it responds to touch too quickly, um, it's a terrible replacement for pipe organs, but it makes it really, really good for services or religious spaces where there's a lot of um, dy dynamism and things that are changing very, very quickly. First Church of Deliverance is the church on Wabash Avenue um, in Chicago where the, um, the minister of music, Kenneth Morris, um, who was, a, he was a, um, he exhibited the Hammond organ for one of the um, music companies in Chicago. He would show people how to play the organ. Uh, he convinced the pastor, Father Clarence Cobb, to purchase a Hammond organ. And they are the first probably church in Chicago to have a radio broadcast with the Hammond organ. They're not the first church to have a Hammond organ, but they are probably the first excuse me, church to have a radio broadcast that had the Hammond organ. So people would come and listen to the Hammond organ. And he, um, Kenneth Morris would say things like, uh, he, in, he liked the Hammond organ because you could invent sounds that had never been heard before because you didn't have to use the presets like you do on a Wurlitzer. Um, you could actually sculpt your own sound with the thing called the draw bars, which are these metal, um, these metal sliders that actually ch change the sound immediately. And like, you can change the sound of a chord without removing your hand, which is something that also is really, really important. You can change the sound that it's making as it is making it without having to release your hand and then play a new sound. And so mechanically it's doing all of this. And because it's an electric instrument, it doesn't get tired in the same kind of way. You still gotta oil it and have it serviced properly. But like there are <laughs> um, the mechanics of the instrument actually lend it to, uh, places where there's a lot of drama and where you want to go to, from loud to soft really quickly in order to increase the sort of awareness of the congregants to something's happening now that we have to pay attention to, something that we need to listen to, something that we need to be attentive to. The musician can try to match that litur liturgical force and drive with the mechanical um, force of the Hammond organ. I hope that answers some of it. It wasn't my question, but it answered a lot of my questions. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's getting it's getting a little late. Perhaps there's one final question from someone in the audience. I feel like that wants to be a question. Okay, Zoom user, can you can you speak about the concept of being churched in the African American community? I'm thinking about how even if you are not Christian, there is a certain understanding of the connection to church. You know, the songs, music, you probably have an auntie who's on the usher board and wears dolly on the head. You have a, 
and you have knowledge of the behavior both inside and out. I mean, yes, that's, I mean, like, it's not complicated. It's in sometimes, it's sometimes a problem um, because I think that the, I think that the church or churchy nature of black social life gets collapsed with Christianity. And I think that that's something that I am hoping to, through characters like Jamal, pull away from. That churchiness does not have to belong to the Christians because churchiness or being churched is, it seems to me, more about like the practice of black social life, which understands spirituality as a material practice that you do with other people. Um, that gets real hairy though, because the idea the idea of it, I think, is really true, but that idea gets collapsed by so many people with Christianity is the right doctrinal or theological orientation and reflection. And my dear friend, um, Camille Orshad um, Mumin will say that that's Christian chauvinism. And like, you need to like, give that up because that's really, one you do, it's like um, when my Muslim friends go to Christian funerals and like, they're like kind of targeted as the ones to whom the salvation message needs to be preached. Like, you know, this person's life is over. And so where they are is just where they are. But some of you are still, and you still need to make a choice about, you know, your confession of faith. And like, literally they'll say that because, you know, they're wearing a kimar, they will be, they will be pointed out or like people will just look at them as like, you are the person that's in need of salvation. And it's like, yeah, that, that's a problem. And so like, on the one hand, I think that there is a kind of churchy atmosphere of black social life. And so like, you know, I remember learning that a lot of my Muslim friends actually know like the Clark sisters and listen to them or Yolanda Adams and be like, well, why would you? And it's like, well, because it's black music. <laughs> and for some folks, their parents are converts. And so their parents listened to gospel music and did not give up gospel music when they reverted. Um, and yet uh, their kids are not sort of um, converse and they didn't grow up in church and then, you know, take the Shahada. And so that means something different for them. And so, you know, I think that the churchiness is an atmospheric um, pressure that we need to attend to. I think it could be a deeply beautiful thing when we recognize on the one hand that the sounds that are being made in the church are not like the supersession of and thus the perfection of what has come before it. Islam like oh you know that was good for then but now we are finally we have finally perfected it because we are not finally Christian like that's we need to give that up. Um, this idea of supersession really really needs to be sort of let go of and instead think about what could we think about in terms of our capacity for being in relation when we recognize that there is a sonic relationship between what's happening in the black church in terms of the drive or the taking it to church or like when they say let's take it to church it's typically like minor chords and like uh augmented and and, and suspended dominant and uh, i'm not a theorist so leave me alone but like suspended dominance or something like that but y'all know what I mean like it sounds a certain way but the sound of a certain way is it seems to me related to the sound of Islam and so um I, I want us to think about and then like to say nothing of like um African traditional or indigenous religious religious practice and non-Christian practice or other practices like Buddhism or atheism or agnosticism too as also having the capacity to do churchiness but not having to be sort of reducible to um, Christian doctrine and orientation and reflection. So thank you for that question. Thank you very much uh, for taking us to the point of uh, interreligious engagement, which we also are committed to. Um, but this is, this is a Castaneda lecture. So let's, let's just have one little moment for you uh, to talk about sex. Uh, <laughs> what struck me, <laughs> what struck me about that first song you played for uh, Ron Wynans, Wynans was it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The language is so seductive, yeah, I mean, uh, and yet it's uh, a part of a system of repression. Can you talk about that in a minute? I can. Um, just to answer Ralph real quick, I don't go. I don't go to church no more, so I don't know oh. how to accept it. I'm not actually <laughs> looking for them to accept it. Like that's, um, you know, they probably think I'm going to hell. I don't know. Like I, I have, I. I've kind of made peace with that sort of thing um, because I don't believe in heaven or hell. So I'm just like, ah, you know, 
I did this whole thread on Twitter about decolonizing Christianity and giving up the anxiety of hell and I don't believe in it. And like almost every response from an Orthodox Christian was, well, you're going, you must be happy that you're going to hell. I'm like, but I don't believe in it. So I don't understand why we are responding. <laughs> but like, oh, so, um, I mean, yeah, I mean, like the, the, the Ronald Winans, I mean, it's really, really sensual and it's weird. Like, I loved the song as a kid. And then when I started writing this project, I would cry listening to it and talking about it. But like, I still really love it. I think it's like, I think it's a great song, but I, I because of the sort of ethical um, sort of space in which it is being sung, um, has this deeply, deeply homophobic uh, uh, foundation. It's real hard to like, sort of remember what it was like to hear it as a 13 year old. So like, as a 13 year old, I'm not hearing it in like the, the sensuality and the eroticism of it. I, I'm hearing it in terms of like the things that are going to be required of me. So like, I'm not actually able to filter in such a way that I can hear or sense the sensuality of it at all, because I have so much deep anxiety about what the song is saying that will be required of me as a person mm -hmm. so that I could live a good and sanctified holy life. And, I, and I'm sure that's not just me. Wow. And, I'm, and, I'm, and I actually probably think that Ronald Winans was the same way, that the mm -hmm. language did not have to, I think because, I think because sex and sexuality is such a, um, um, uninterrogated set of concepts for lots and lots of church um, practice that even when the language could be in the service of something more liberatory, and it actually isn't. Cause I don't think that's, you know, like when I was shouting at church, I wasn't thinking like, oh, that person looks so good. <laughs> I was, I was really in it. And so like, sometimes I, Sometimes I want to say like, there's this not because the relationship is always there regardless of if one senses it or not. The relationship between like a kind of deep sensuality and sort of these um, black Christian practices is always there. I do not know if the congregants are actively thinking about it most of the time. I think that most of the time what the congregants are thinking is this is for, this is for Jesus. Mm -hmm. And like that, cre that creates the problem because then it can allow for so much uninterrogated uh, violence to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, the story I'll tell you is like, I, I, I wrote about it in an essay about Lil Nas X, but mm -hmm. I'd gone to this church service with my music teacher whose cousin is this amazing music. Um, and he was in town and his pastor was in town. They're from the South. And we went to this church service at this pastor who he had to have been 25 when he passed away. It seemed really old to me. I was like 16 years old at the time, but he died with AIDS complications. Um, very young man and, but very clearly gay, like very clearly gay to me. And the, the guest preacher, um, is like preaching about the sins of fornication and fornication and homosexuality was taken over my church. And we had to fast and pray and get over that because I said, we will not let Satan take over here. And like, you know, the people are praising, you know, as they do. And after the church service, this man said to me, I could tell you a bad boy. And I was like, hmm. by which I mean, this man was not only flirting with me. I mean, like, it was like bad. Mm. But like, it's like, when he's saying this to me, I'm literally like, what? Mm. Like, what are you talking about? I'm like, I'm not a bad boy. And like, he kept repeating it and smiling at me. And it's like, the, the refusal to actually interrogate what this song means, mm. like for Ronald mm. Winans, that refusal to actually think about it having the possibility of a kind of eroticism is what creates the foundation upon which this preacher who was just preaching against homosexuality, who was probably 50 years old, who was flirting with a 16 year old and the people around me said nothing. Mm. They heard it, they ain't do nothing. And so I'm like, mm. I don't know if people are actively thinking about it because there's so much sexual violence and, and assault mm. and, um, 
unkindness that literally happens. And mm -hmm. I think that it can only happen when one like continues to pretend that there's nothing beyond like the surface level of these words, that, mm -hmm. that it is an enactment of power and authority to, to like not interrogate these things, to not ask these questions. And, and so, you know, as a 13 year old, I'm certainly not thinking about this in the register of sex and sexual, I'm thinking about it only as like, I need to get saved, like exactly. serious. And like, it's like a, trying to write this project has been the hardest because it's mm -hmm. mostly like trying to re-inhabit what it was when I was 10, 11, 12, and 13, which was like a terrifying time for me. Mm -hmm. So. Thank you for, so much for sharing with us, uh, for thinking There's with us. There's one more question. I'm happy oh, to take the last question. If, sure, please. I'll just take this last one. Sure. Is it me? Yeah. Oh, sorry. No, I just wanted to actually um, come on and say that I appreciate you um, so much. I'm a student um, at um, um, School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and I, my work is really uh, around this, like, um, and I, you know, I, you, you could pull from so many scholars that are like Zora Neale or like all these people in the past. And like, I feel like what you gave, <laughs> like right now, is like stuff that uh, I was looking so long to find um, coming out of the Black church and what my work centered around that. I just, you know, I, I appreciate you. <laughs> and um, I wanted to say that um, I, I see you and I see what you're doing um, and it's affecting and it's uh, um, really useful stuff. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Really, you know. Beautiful. Appreciate Thank you. Questions. Thank you for being here. Thank you everyone for being here. If you want to unmute and say good night and thank you, uh, I uh, welcome you to do so. And we'll say good night to Dr. Crowley. Thanks so much. Good night, everybody. Thank I'm just so reading. Much. Thank good you. night. Thank, thank you. Thank good night. You're amazing. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Amazing. Good night, thank you for your good night everybody. Good to y'all. Good work. Good Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. Good night, Pastor Ann says hi. Oh, great. Hi. <laughs>